Hey, it's good to have you here. Come on in, have a seat. Welcome to the Beyond Picket Fences podcast. We are your hosts, Mandy Benicky and Naomi Marquez. Today, we welcome Laura Goldstein to our table. Laura is an internal family systems therapist, and she has been in professional practice assisting families, couples, and individuals since 1996. Laura obtained her BA in psychology at Denison University in Ohio and her master's degree in social work from Hunter College in New York. She is a member of the National Association of Social Workers. In her personal life, Laura is a lover of nature, her friends and family, music, and yoga. Today, Laura brings to our table a topic that is very much the forefront in America right now. Sit back and listen in as we unwrap white privilege with the brilliant Laura Goldstein. Hey, Naomi. Hey, Mandy. How are you doing? Good. Happy Saturday. Happy Saturday. Ah, We've got a great guest today. Yes. Super excited. Awesome, awesome topics. And so without further ado, uh, hi, Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi, ladies. Thanks for having me as a guest on your podcast. Yes, we're so, so excited. So where would you like to start? Well, I think that I'd like to start just at the topic that's been taking up, occupying most of my brain energy these past several weeks in terms of white privilege and this race pandemic that we are all struggling with currently. That's great. Is this something that you've been challenged with professionally? Absolutely. It's been challenging professionally, personally. It just cop- it's a topic that just keeps coming up more and more in terms of, and my privilege being white and how I get, I'm really privileged actually to be able to talk to people on a daily basis about uncomfortable topics. And so therefore it's also given me my privilege as a therapist and not only as my race to dig into these topics and really understand myself, how I relate to others, how I'm showing up, what I've, what my biases are and how I can really dig deeper into this subject. So it's been really devastating on some levels and heartbreaking um, and uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Where would you where would you like to take the listeners first through that through those emotions or struggles that I think that first it, it just I need to give props to the internal family systems model that I have been working so closely with as a therapist for the past six years. This internal family systems model or called I'll refer to it as IFS was created by a man named Dick Schwartz. And as a therapist, it's a model that I have you I use all the time. It talks about parts, parts of us, multiplicity that resides in all of us, which is really expansive in terms of therapy, gets us out of this diagnostic framework and really lets us have conversations about parts of ourselves. So there's you're not always one thing. And so this parts model really creates a beautiful platform to explore yourself and not get so attached to I'm always this way or I'm never this way. We try and get out of the extreme versions of ourselves. So with that, we use a lot of curiosity to go inwards. And so with that model, I have been able to talk about a part of myself that comes up and it, it gives, it just gives me so much more space to talk about hard topics. And in this one, especially this, this race topic. Mm-hmm. How, how, what, what tools would you like, would you like to go into tools that people have to have these tough conversations with yeah, themselves I mean, I or with people? Where do you want to go with that? Well, I think that I, again, that uniqueness that I have is because I've been trained. Um, I've been trained as a social worker. I have my master's in social work. And so I have learned how to have uncomfortable conversations. And I think that the tools that people need, you know, are really, really important in terms to how to bring up these topics that you may be inhibited to bring up because you're afraid to, you're going to hurt someone, you're afraid you're going to offend somebody, you don't know your own real views on it. So we just get this, you know, discomfort that's like, okay, let's just avoid this conversation because I'm not good at this stuff, right? So that can just immediately create this avoidance. 
So I think the tools that are really needed are curiosity, respect, empathy. Those are the top three that in order to have really, really uncomfortable conversations with people is just to check in with that. Am I being curious with someone or am I being challenging? And those are two different things in my opinion, because if I ha- if I use curiosity and in IFS language, we talk about that as a quality of self being curious um, and versus what I'm trying to challenge someone, you know, sometimes that challenging energy can be hard. It can be, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's a fight, it's a stance versus curiosity. I can stay grounded. I can stay calm. And I can still have the ability to have a really uncomfortable conversation. Right. Learning how to be curious and ask questions in a way where um, you leave the the listener in, or you engage them instead of, you know, making them put up a wall immediately. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So when the wall comes and that is even, you know, in a place in terms of when that wall comes up, that is also using curiosity within yourself, right? To just understand what just happened to me if I feel that wall come up. Now that takes mindfulness and that takes practice to understand. Mm-hmm. A lot of us are on automatic pilot and we just keep going. We just keep bypassing when that wall comes up as you're referring to. My knowledge and experience just it's it's like when we feel that wall like oh here it is okay what's happening can i pause can i realize that that wall is indicating something and yeah and and going into to why and and Naomi and I talked about this when we talked about open mindedness in our very first podcast how just exactly like you said, going back and questioning, you know, I have this uncomfortable, angry feeling about what you just said. Why is that? And a lot of times what, what comes up is you're angry at somebody for displaying maybe some of the traits that you have, you have, and you may not like within yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. That is a great, great example, because that is why am I so triggered like this? Oh, yeah, usually this means this is what I don't like about myself Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we definitely have trouble with. So, yes, that getting that curious about ourselves and to really um, to talk about that as I mean, there's so many different places we can go with discomfort and where what happens to us as humans when we have discomfort inside of ourselves. So. I'm not sure if we'll go there now, but this is, in, I mean, in terms of tools, I think that pausing and breathing when that discomfort comes is one of the bigger, you know, greatest tools you're going to give yourself to slow down. Mm-hmm. What yeah. about respect? Respect is huge in the way of just even acknowledging before you go into these difficult conversations with people, do I respect this person? Because the way we talk to people, if we don't respect them, is probably going to be in a way that they're not going to be able to hear, right? So the idea of being able to be heard, which, you know, I work with so many clients and couples, and when we break down what is really going on for most of us is we want to be heard and we want to mm-hmm. be listened to. And yet so many people are in are not respecting one themselves or others, and they just keep going. They're not listening to others. So I think respect is really, really important is respecting what this other person is saying fully, not hearing one word, two words, and then creating your retort, right? Like that's like, okay, now I know what I'm going to say next. Respect is listening to the person fully and completely, letting them have their idea, letting it marinate for inside of you then mm-hmm. you can give a response. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, there's a couple areas that you mentioned that I struggle with. And in regard to that, it's, you know, do I respect this person? Mm-hmm. It is determining whether or not engaging this particular person in their current beliefs is engaging them in this conversation <sighs> going to produce a positive outcome. Is it worth our time to engage? Hmm. So that's kind of where I struggle. Um, You know, some people really do want to have an in-depth conversation to learn. And there are a lot of people out there who just want to argue and be right. And like you said, don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me to, 
to determine to to end the conversation or <laughs> to mm-hmm. keep going is a struggle. And that's hard when you're when you you pinpoint white privilege as the topic you are trying to be curious about with the other person and respectful and have empathy, right? So when when you are trying to if you're on the receiving end and somebody is challenging your white privilege and your view on whether you have biases or if you're a racist or not, or if you're trying to communicate with somebody else about their recognizing their white privilege, which is hard for a lot of white people to do, then to recognize if you have biases, then to recognize if you're a racist, right? Like mm-hmm. those are tough conversations and it, you do end up, and that's where that open-mindedness that we talk about is you have to be open-minded to that person and you have to have respect for that person and you have to have empathy for that person and you have to be curious for that person. And that's hard on this topic. It's really hard on this topic. Um, And Mindy, you said something there that in terms of a positive outcome, and I think that's something we, we need to define. What is a positive outcome, right? Because positive that's, you know, I, that, that language and, you know, pardon my, like that I get that way sometimes with language like positive or good or bad. And that's a framework, right? That we're accustomed to. It's like, okay, if it's positive, that's good. If it's negative, it's bad and good and bad and right and wrong. And I think that as humans, we like those words because it gives us a framework of what direction to go in. But as we're Mm -hmm. talking about this, you know, very, this hard topic of racism and white privilege, there may be like the outcome may be that I have to do a lot of work and that may not feel very positive for people. So the discomfort that comes now, that's something we have to, you know, we have to learn from. So that's just something in terms of how I work with people. It's like, okay, what is positive for you? Because these kind of conversations that we're having are extremely positive because we're talking about things that people don't really like, oh, I don't really want to talk about this because it makes me so uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it, that that brings up the other que- the question that I had or the, the issue that I have is um, with being uncomfortable um, and being white, um, mm-hmm. is it appropriate for me to, to be vocal um, and how, what, how, how is... Um, what, where, I guess what I'm trying to say is where, where can I, where is my place in all of this? Yeah. Um, I want to help move toward equality for all. I believe what, you know, what's been going on um, now and forever is wrong. I don't believe, um, you know, I think we should be past this, but um I'm not a black woman. I'm not a black person. I've never experienced what they experience. I recognize that. Um, At some point, am I being too vocal? Am I using my privilege in the wrong way? Hmm. And what would be that? What in your, in that language of what would be the wrong way? So for me, uh, am I being vocal about something that I don't understand? Hmm. I don't fully understand. Right. Which means, and I do think that this brings up um, Robin D'Angelo's book of white fragility, um, because you are white, I am white. And I think that if we can look at how our racism as whiteness is, then we do, we do get it from that perspective. I too, I'm not black. I don't understand what it's like to be a black woman. I don't understand what it's like to have that fear of letting my child go out and fearing that the cops are going to arrest her based on the color of her skin. So I Mm -hmm. don't have that perspective. Um, I have the perspective of being white and what I'm learning more and more. I mean, this is, is, you know, I got my master's in social work in 1996. And one of the more profound moments I had then was around, it was an article called white privilege, unpacking the invisible knapsack. And that really got my attention and understanding my white privilege um, in different ways that I just had never thought about. And I was in New York City and just learning that, yeah, people don't move away from me as they pass me on the street where they do a black person. I don't mm-hmm. invoke that sense of fear around people. 
and that and it really got me thinking. And she goes on, she does a really great job. Um, her name is Peggy McIntosh, and she writes an article about white privilege unpacking the invisible knapsack. And that really got me thinking on the, you know, at that time, and how I, as a white girl, was going to work in the Bronx. How was I going to be effective? How was I going to be effective as a, you know, wow, I, you know, so my white privilege was something I really had to get like, okay, really examine and take a deep dive into. And now it's 2020 and I'm learning even more based on what we're dealing with right now in this pandemic of racism, of how it is my responsibility as a white person to to do more, to really do more. So to your question of, is it wrong? I, I think, again, if we do it with respect and curiosity, that and empathy, we we can really talk about anything. I really believe that. Well, and it, to answer, if I can answer Mandy's question, we're experts in white privilege. So we're not, we can never be an expert in somebody of color, but we right. can, we can be an expert to other white people and help them and educate them on white privilege and um, helping them understand what white privilege is. Mm -hmm. And white privilege is when you have, you know, two people who have the same income, they live in the same zip code, they drive the same cars, they have the exact same education. Everything's the same. One person is a person of color. One person is white. Your white skin is your privilege, equal playing field um, until you get to skin color. Mm -hmm. And that will get you through the door. And that white privilege is where people really, really struggle in my circle in trying to educate white people on white privilege, because I'm an expert in that. Mm -hmm. Why is it? Why do you think... Um... Laura, why, why do you think to some people, um, just the phrase white privilege, and I'm, I'm referring to other white people, why do you think that's such a trigger and so offensive? Great question. I think it's because the first, it's such, it's, they feel people, we feel so defensive because our, we are taught that prejudice, racism is bad. So, you know, back to that, like that we're a bad person if we are racist. And that's, you know, that's what I was taught, right? That we are, you're a bad person if you're racist. And mm -hmm. that is actually not true. It, you're not a bad person. It's just the only culture. It's the, no, not culture. I should say that. It's the only race I've been a part of. Right, right. I was actually listening to, um, I've, I've heard this recently twice. Um, I am currently listening to the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, and he mentions in there that um, there is basically no single soul alive that isn't racist to mm -hmm. some level. And then um, and then I, I was listening to a podcast, um, uh, a Brene Brown podcast with Laverne Cox, um, who is a black trans woman. Um, she's an actress. Mm -hmm. um, and she was, she was saying the exact same thing. Um, you know, we all, you know, to some level are racist and before we can um, to make, make ch any change, you, you kind of need to recognize that within you. And I guess that goes back to um, for us, you know, white privilege and being okay with that. And, and what, do, how do I, how do I use that, recognizing that to And use it to our advantage. And correct. that's, that's the thing that, you know, I have the narrative I have tried to communicate to my white circle is we have a privilege. We need to use that privilege to change laws, to change the systematic racism, right? To, to change the things that keep people of color down. And our voice is only a voice. We have to have action that follows that. And that's our white privilege because we do get voted in. We do have the money. We do have the power. We have the power of our voice that other white people listen to and okay. they will listen to us. And we have to use that, not just on Facebook and Instagram, along with helping with voting and helping with that message and getting other white people and change will only happen if other white people help. I, you know, I said this about, you know, women's rights, our women's rights happened because men stood by us and they went and voted for our rights, right? They're the ones who made sure that there was protection and salaries and making sure we could, you know, get up in the employment ladder. We as white people have to expect that out of ourselves when we expected that out of men. 
Absolutely. And using racism no, and knowing that our whiteness, that our racism elevates white people and it has. And therefore now can we, you know, one of my favorite sayings is use your power for good, not evil. And, mm-hmm. you know, let's talk about that with women. Um, and we can talk about it in being white as well, because we have had the privilege and it has elevated us in the society, which has been built for white people. Right. Absolutely. How do you have empathy when you're talking to somebody about white privilege? That's a great question too. How do, I mean, so I think empathy <laughs> is a, that's difficult that <laughs> sometimes. It, it, it can be, especially if you get, you know, where I lose, where I lose my empathy, empathy is when the defensiveness comes, you know, in another person, then all of a sudden I'm triggered because the defensiveness comes. And then I'm like, okay, how can I have empathy? Um, which is interesting, but my experience with empathy, you, you know, empathy is one of those things that people talk about. And there's a lot of confusion between empathy and sympathy. Empathy requires understanding like, oh yeah, I've been in that situation. Maybe not the same one as this person, but I've been in a place of struggle. I've been in a place of despair. I've been in a place of hopelessness. So I can now connect with you like, oh gosh, yeah, that must be so hard for you. And that is an empathetic response versus looking like looking away from someone. And Brene Brown does, you know, she's one of my idols. I reference her all the time, but she does a really good short little cartoon about empathy, empathy versus sympathy. And empathy is really getting down in with somebody and hearing them and listening to them. And sympathy takes it like, oh, yeah. That must be really hard. I'll see you later. And you really don't want that connection. But you're, you're giving this kind of, you know, sympathetic response, if you will. But empathy is really being connected with someone and not necessarily knowing, no, I never, this never actually did happen to me, but I have had hard things happen to me. Mm-hmm. If that makes That's, sense. No, it does with white privilege, because that means you have to look at yourself and know that you've had that discomfort. So if if you're talking to somebody about white privilege and they get frustrated and they get angry, that means if you don't have empathy, if I can't have empathy for you, that means I'm saying I have never been uncomfortable. That's right. Recognizing it, which is baloney, right? As a white person, we're, you know, we know how we have been programmed and we know that we have a certain view of people that are not white, unconscious or conscious. Right. And for us, not to have empathy means that we have never been in your shoes, which we may not, we may not still be in your shoes, but we had to get here at some point. Right. So, you know, that is a really, really great thing that I'm going to look at more on why I can't be empathetic towards people who haven't recognized their white privilege yet. And I'm going to work on that. Well, and I think it goes back, um, when you said, um, I don't know what it's like to be a black person walking down, be a, but we'll just say a black man walking down the street. I don't know what it's like for somebody else walking by to be afraid of me because of the color of my skin. I've never experienced that. I've never experienced anything like that. However, I know what it must feel like for somebody to immediately not like, and be afraid of me. Um, especially when, um, and going back again, um, I have not been heard. Like, you know what I mean? Um, um, so we going back to like being heard, um, you're not, I guess it's not giving you're immediately discounted discounted without being heard i know what that feels like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that's great so you can find empathy somewhere exactly you know um and and going into empathy a little more i was you know just thinking um about other conversations we've had aside from this podcast about um the traits and values that we have in the society that are considered weak And I think um, empathy oftentimes is considered something that's weak. And you see this, especially, I see it, 
in the political divide that we have. Um, you know, we have one side that is very empathetic, call it snowflake, whatever, bleeding heart, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then, and then the other side um, that is saying you're weak because you're like that. You know what I mean? Um, so just just an observation, <laughs> right? So that that mm-hmm. that skill set, which is so necessary, using having empathy in order to have these hard hard conversations, and then, and as you just said, that is that's a part, Mandy, that you're talking about the part of me that thinks I'm weak. So right there, there's a polarization, and that's what we talk about in IFS frequently. There's a polarized there's polarization in most things. Should I do this? Should I do that? And right there, as you're saying, how can I have this conversation? If I use empathy and I perceive that as a weakness, yet then there's this other part that really wants to connect and learn and grow and evolve in this. How do I do that? How do I navigate that? So then we'd have to go to, okay, let's unpack what weakness means to you. And that goes into a whole other conversation about vulnerability and emotions and where that gets programmed inside of us and what that is. So that's, you know, emotional connection and vulnerability is also, you know, something that we have learned in our society, in our family of origin, similar to this conversation that we're having about whiteness. These are things we've learned. Mm -hmm. Now I think in these, like, can I look at this and say, oh yeah, this is something I learned in my family of origin and it actually doesn't serve me today in 2020. So what do I do now? There's the conundrum. Well, and that brings up a whole nother topic of, you know, p- changes, change is hard, change is difficult. It's scary. Um, and, and oftentimes you hear it like, this is how it's, this is how we've always done it. And I'm fine. We're all fine. Why do we have to fight? Mm-hmm. Why can't we all just get along and just move forward and pretend like everything is okay? Because for me, it was okay, you know? Um, and, you know, that just brings up a whole, a whole new topic um, in that regard. Well, yeah. Why can't it just be okay? Because it's been okay for me. Then that goes to that white privilege, right? That we, that we can say that like, okay, it's been okay for me. So I don't need to do this hard work. I don't have to have these hard conversations because implicitly I can use my whiteness and keep going. Well, that goes to, you know, I, I, when I, when I talk to women and, and men and, and my children, and, you know, I try to put examples that help them understand And so one of the things I wanted to bring up today was as women and as women who are fighting for women and fighting for our right to be vulnerable and and not to be put in um, a box and not to be kept behind the fence. You know, we talk about how we expect men are going to lead by example, our men in our lives, and they are going to understand that women's rights are human's rights. And we expect that they are going to say what needs to be said in a room with other men who are not and are not educated in what um, women's rights look like. And if we expect that of the men around us, why don't we expect that of ourselves? As women, we too experience um, where we need the support from other people in another gender to help support our cause. Mm -hmm. So as women, we find it difficult for us to do that ourselves because we don't understand what it's like to be a person of color. Well, we expect men to do it and they don't know what it's like to be a woman. And do they get to have, you know, there, that's gotta be an uncomfortable conversation for them too. And, but we don't, we don't sit down and talk to them about, does it hurt your feelings? Are you going to be really upset about that if they fight back with you? Like, no, you better sit right there. You better defend me until the until that guy is black and blue on the ground, right? And but as and so for me, it helps me see what do I expect my husband to do. I expect myself to do the same thing for a person of color on the other end, and it is a tough conversation. But I expect my husband to do the same thing. So that's my you know it helps me know that I I'm not going to I don't want to give myself a cushion that I didn't give my husband to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think you said that, you know, as you just got that escalated, like that expectation, you know, like I expect you to do that, right? Like that's, you're my husband. And there's this like, you should language, right? Like that's, um, that's what's expected. And, and where does that come from? You know, why is that expectation that someone Mm -hmm. as is going to do that for you? 
Mm-hmm. Right. I would think that I would think that that would, you know, if you think about the reason I want my husband to do that is to show that he, 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 he understands my suffering. Mm-hmm right? He sympathizes with my suffering. He has empathy for my suffering. He, he doesn't believe that my, he's, it would validate my feelings, right? Right. Right. And that's when you talk to people of color, that is part of their issue with white people is that we, because we won't speak, that we don't, understand the cause. We don't understand the challenges that they have because we don't have a voice that we use to talk to other white people about it. Right. And so we're not showing compassion. We're not showing that love because we don't speak out. And I think what you just said too, is being validated. That's a big one, you know, that comes up in terms of, I have this, you just said, I have this expectation because you want your husband to validate your struggle. And that's an interesting one too, in terms of couplehood, in terms of humans, in terms of all different relationships, right? Like how we feel validated in our struggle. And, you know, I think that that's another piece that's coming up, you know, in terms of my work right now with people is this conversation about white privilege versus personal struggle. And I'm hearing people who are like, gosh, you know, I've done a lot. I've had a lot of personal struggle. I've had a lot of loss. I've had a lot of death. I've had a divorce, abandonment, illness. Like I get it. And you don't get it because that's personal struggle versus racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's a big separation, I think, in that, and that's, that's we as white people, that's part of that defensiveness that comes like, I've struggled too. You know, we all want to be validated by others to let them, for them to know how hard we've struggled in our own world. But that's not the subject here, right? The subject here is racism versus personal struggle. That, if you want to talk personal struggle, we're in a whole different conversation. That's the, that is the rodeo that ends up happening in my white circle. The difference, the, the, the the personal struggle is the defense. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And Mm -hmm. that's what I've been noticing too, that, that defensive reaction. And again, it goes back to what I do think is that, that because as white people, we were, we've been taught this way that we're bad people. If we're talking about racism or acknowledging Mm -hmm. racism. Yeah. I think that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing that is, I guess, helped me um, break that wall or jump that hurdle with, with somebody who um, has that, that barrier is, um, especially if, if they're a parent, um, having them realize a scenario where, for example, um, I had this conversation um, with one of our other podcast guests, um, who is a black black mother of a black child. Um, and I said, you know, I was thinking about it and I have a 12 year old son. Um, and he is now, you know, given the freedom to take his bike and ride around the neighborhood and, you know, do his own thing without me by his side. And so when he leaves, I'm like, okay, make sure you have your phone, um, grab a hoodie if you're cold. Um, and those are my two worries, right? Like, you know, be safe. Don't get hit by a car, you know, (laughs) you know, um, but I realized if my son were black, grab a hoodie is potentially a danger for yeah. him in, in, in our world and, and even in our city. Uh, we just saw with Elijah McLean, uh, wore a hoodie to his local convenience store to buy an iced tea, had his face covered, ends up, you know, being arrested and, and killed by the police. Um, and, and often like when I have that conversation of, about Elisha, both um, people of color and white people are like, well, why was he wearing a hoodie? Why was he covering his face in a store? You know, uh, we're, we're given that right. <laughs> we can walk around. And, and, and so to bring it back to getting somebody else to understand, like I tell my son all the time, you know, grab a hoodie in case you get cold. I mean, we're in Colorado. It gets, the weather changes, you know, in five minutes. Um, And so it's interesting how quickly 
their idea can change based on the color of that child's skin. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about an adult who, you know, maybe can make decisions and still has the right to wear a hoodie, but we're talking about a child here. Um, And so I think when, when I have those conversations, um, you think a little bit more when it's somebody who's maybe in your eyes more vulnerable. Absolutely. And I've been having that same, same reflection recently, seeing people out in the world, um, one in this pandemic wearing masks and doing that all new, uncomfortable norm. And that and watching young children play and black children on their bikes or in the park. And I've, that's been my reflection is like, Oh, wow. What happens before, like, where are their parents freaking out about this right now? These kids, you know, I saw these kids in Rhino on a bike, like, you know, few black kids just like smiling and having fun. And, and my reaction was, I wonder what their parents are thinking right now. Are they worried? Are they concerned with all of this heightened language? But they, then I thought, you know, they've been probably thinking about this for a lot longer than I have. Of course they have. The, the movie, The Hate You Give, um, is a, that's a, my daughter did st- studies on that last year. And so we watched that and that's a really good movie. Um, that's really helpful to hear how this family and this man in particular prepares his kids around being black and driving and what to do when you get pulled over by a cop. Yeah, you know, my, my husband, um, was raised, he's Hispanic um, and he was raised, put your head down. You don't say anything. You don't talk back. Don't give eye contact. Um, do not do any kind of, you know, uh, quick jerks, right? You just, you, and you just mind your own and let it run its course. And that's very different than white people. We don't have a car. No one ever trained me on how to get pulled over. If my mm-hmm. parents did not sit me down and say, when you get pulled over by the police, this is what you do. Or if you're walking down the police, the street and a police car comes up to you, this is what you do. Not once, mm-hmm. but in the community of color, those are conversations that they have that are like uh, the talk, right? Mm-hmm. As white people, that's talking about sex. Mm-hmm. And the if people of color, that's talking about your interaction with police. And very different in that. And, you know, that is that white privilege yeah. that mm-hmm. we talk about. And what does that look like? You know, my example is the other day I was walking with a neighbor and we were walking down a cul-de-sac and we wanted to take pictures of these flowers. So my neighbor walks right up into the neighbor's yard, goes right up to their tree, is up taking pictures. And in my mind, I said, If we were black or Mexican, would a neighbor be okay with us walking right up into the yard, taking pictures, not asking permission? Didn't, they didn't know what we were there for. And we are so white. We have no problem going deep into somebody's yard, taking pictures and walking out. Why would they ever bother us? My husband's like, I would, that's, I would never go randomly into someone's yard and go look at their landscaping and take pictures and leave. (laughs) That's white privilege. That's white privilege. (laughs) And I, we walked, we left the yard and I told my neighbor, I'm like, that was exactly white privilege. Mm -hmm. Stamp it. Yeah. In the moment. That's a great example. Think about how many times you do that. Mm -hmm. And if you had, if your skin color was different. For sure. If your skin color. And for me, I can share an example where white privilege, how it benefited me in terms of growing up, um, taking risks and, I have that kind of rule breaking energy part of me that wants to kind of, you know, live on the edge, take some risks. And in terms of my upbringing where, you know, I'll just this example of underage drinking where I got arrested for underage drinking and I was in, I know, grand, grand, (laughs) I know, right? Got arrested for underage drinking. I'm naming it, owning it. Um, My parents were so excited when I finally turned 21 because they're like, gosh, Laura. Um, At least that's one thing you can't get arrested for. Right? Exactly. You can't get arrested for underage drinking any longer. Thank you. Because it happened (laughs) twice that I was arrested. Um, And I, but that, as I reflect back, that was white privilege because that risk that 
yeah, I got arrested, but I didn't end up in jail. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to pay mm -hmm. a fine one time and it's another time I had to get a lawyer. And that was all part of white privilege and that and class privilege, really, because I had the money to get a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But I didn't have that. That was the privilege. I didn't even think like, oh, yeah, if, if I get arrested, I'm going to end up in jail. I didn't. And it didn't even, you know, come into my mind. And then the more and more I'm learning, another resource I would, you know, suggest to people is 13, the 13th Amendment that's on Netflix. And that mm -hmm. really opened my eyes to, you know, had I been black and 20 years old and got arrested, I would have been put in jail for sure. Yeah. No, it's a great one. Yeah. Right. Or like, um, I was just thinking, you know, I, I, when you say, uh, when you're younger, um, I was pulled over for speeding, I don't know, 15 times at least. And, um, uh, you know, every time you're kind of in a panic and, um, you know, you're pulled over and what's the first thing, it, the first thing I did was I'd reach in my glove box. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be digging in my glove box for my registration. Cause I know, cause I've, I've been here before what they're going to ask for, right? Like I'm, I'm already reaching for my registration. I'm already reaching, you know, digging through my purse for my ID. Um, and you know, sometimes in a panic, I'm taking off my seatbelt and putting it back on, you know? Um, and you know, we, we hear of these other incidents where, um, you know, black, black people are pulled over for, for whatever, um, and they're doing the same thing, you know, they're digging around for what they need and they end up shot because the cops are, you know, just making assumptions that they're, they're grabbing a gun. That's right. Um, and I mean that, that right, right there is white privilege. Never have I ever been afraid, um, being pulled over that I was going to end up dead, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's true. I think that, um, you know, when we, when we look at what we, how do we prepare for the day, right? Person of color prepares to make sure when they leave the house, they're in um, clothes that will not offend or make other people uncomfortable. <laughs> when they get in their car, they're going to make sure that their registration is in the visor. So when they're pulled over, they only have to pull it down to pull it out versus reaching over. They have to be prepared when they, you know, do X, Y, Z that we don't think about because we want to make sure that we are not offensive and um, we are not making other people feel uncomfortable. To your point, Laura, you're a risk taker. How many people of color are willing to take that risk? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So that is something to look at. Like, wow, being a risk taker and what that does um, is that that's a, exactly that is a privilege that it allowed understanding just not even giving, you know, it's it, thought to it prior to and now understanding that taking those risks are part of this whiteness that we're talking about. Mm hmm. Have you had um, conversations in your work or personally where um, people are starting to challenge themselves with this topic and, and want to challenge themselves and want to get uncomfortable with this? Yes, I have. I think um, there's lots, I've had lots of conversations with clients and friends. And as this is coming up, people are saying, you know, what can I do? Um, and then that I'm like, don't ask black people what you can do. That's the first, that's not, <laughs> that is what I learned. Like it's not their job to tell us what to do about our own racism. So mm -hmm. yes, I've had a lot of people which have brought up this conversation of, first of all, the discomfort, right? Like the discomfort that arises inside of us. What do we do? And oh, Laura, real quick, Laura, you're moving something around because your headphones are really your microphone. Your microphone's going something. in and out. Oh, I don't know if you just moved or my mic. Okay, is that I, better? I think you're good now. Yep. Okay, sorry about that. No, go ahead. Um, so this, I think, in Robin D'Angelo's book, she talks about what do we do when we feel the discomfort. And she talks about the concept of a door out. Do we take the door out, meaning blaming people, blame the messenger and disregard the message? Or do we take the door in, which is asking, why does this unsettle me? 
and that in the door in is a concept that you know I would echo in the language of internal family systems we talk about sitting in sitting in this discomfort trying to understand why does this make me uncomfortable what is it that i am feeling so that i can do something different so i think that is a huge one of the discomfort that's coming and again as we spoke about whether i bypass it because i want to bypass it because i want to look good and that's a part two and in ifs we you know again parts 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 but this is a part of me, I want to, I want to look good to the outside world. I want people to like me. Most people have that part of themselves. They, who doesn't want to be liked? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this conversation really challenges that. And if we look at this discomfort and say, gosh, is this going to make me look bad to people? Hmm. Mm-hmm. As you're saying that, I'm thinking, you know, in these conversations, you know, I know that I can't change anyone. I can change myself and I have a pretty good, um, influence on my children. Um, so those are, you know, that's how I can, you know, make a change. Um, but when you're having these conversations, I think going back to, um, you know, Naomi's point where she said, you know, being silent is, is not only not being helpful, but it's also harmful in letting this continue. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think in my own circle, um, having these tough conversations, um, I tend to, I don't, I don't let, um, I, I don't let racist narratives just, just go and be silent. I will challenge them, but then going back to your point, um, maybe, uh, and one thing, one, uh, topic came up, um, I had, you know, when Colin Kaepernick knelt, um, I had a conversation with family and they were very offended. Um, and so it, it came up at, at a family setting and, and, you know, I probably responded at the time with, with anger. Um, but perhaps the more appropriate response that may have led to maybe a little bit of thought from the other, from the other party um, is, is asking why, why does him kneeling make you so uncomfortable? Mm-hmm. And then having that conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's right. I think the why at having that conversation, and that goes back to, are you curious with that person? Can you be curious? You Can right you be there. empathetic and show respect to that conversation? Why does it make you uncomfortable? Wow. That, that hit it for me right there. Asking why means that I care enough to know why about you. I'm curious. I respect you. I I want to understand where you're at. If I don't ask why, then I'm just dismissing you. Mm-hmm. Correct. I'm thinking about the people I've dismissed in my family. Well, and by dismiss- you know, you go back and you, I didn't ask why. I just said I wasn't open minded, right? And I'm like sticking my middle finger up to them. You're blocked. You're done. <laughs> well, and ultimately when you have these conversations, you know, it's, it's this uncomfortability isn't fun. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm guessing that your goal is to, to change somebody's mind. Right. Um, and when you do that and you, you know, you, 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 you both build the wall, then you're, you're not doing any good. So that's right. Um, so There's yeah. Also a part of, you know, when you, when, when you really look at the, the people who you love, who are people of color and you don't block that person or you don't slap that person in the face. There's a part of me that I feel like I'm letting them down Mm -hmm. that I walk right back into my house with my racist family member and I didn't put him in check and I walk right into my house or I go sit with my best friend or I sit with my friend's husband and I'm like, yeah, I'm a good white person. But my racist family, I'll let them keep doing what they're doing because I have empathy. I'm curious. Or because it's uncomfortable. Because, right. And it's like, and so for, so I, that's, you know, that's where I get angry. That's where I am, you know, standing up for the people I love because they're in my circle. Right. Mm-hmm. And as you look at that, that's hard. And That'll be our next therapy session, Laura. Let's <laughs> pin that. 
And now, oh, and I also have one about the podcast last night. I have a whole nother thing we got to talk about. Wait, can I uh, we'll pin that? And before you go there, I just want to just a, a, a top a, a label actually that I've heard that I think Naomi speaks to that language, what you're talking about that I just learned in, um, again, Robin D'Angelo's book of white fragility, which is this white progressive concept. And I, she talks about those, those people, which is me being the most dangerous um, because of what you just said, Naomi is like, Oh, I get it. I'm less racist or I'm not racist. Um, I'm open-minded. Therefore I'm not racist. Or, you know, in your particular situation, like you have this strong justice that you're going to stand up for people Mm -hmm. and you get it and you're angry or you're angry about this stuff. And so that, you know, that language of white progressive, which is, wow, okay, that now it's that (laughs) that's a dangerous group because we think we're less than we're less racist than others because Mm -hmm. we get it to some level. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. It's it's one of the things you see. Um, white people calling white people out on, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, you, you, you say that you are an ally, Mm -hmm. right? So show me your actions. And that I learned is that people don't like Mm -hmm. that word either. They don't want you, you're not an ally. Mm -hmm. They want, they want to see what you're, you know, you're, you're not an ally just because you get it. You don't get it. That's the key. You're not an ally because of the words you put on Facebook. Right. You're not an ally. It's, it's, you know, racism is power, privilege, and prejudice. So an ally truly has to say, I'm going to use my power to change, make significant change in the, in the justice system and significant change in the money that is thrown around to continue suppressing, to continue the and racism. And with your vote, I mean. Absolutely. Ha- that that's where I struggle is, is you cannot continuously spout off, you know, I'm not racist. I'm not misogynist. You know, I'm, uh, I'm not sexist. I'm not, I'm not this, I'm not that I'm not anti-gay. And then with your vote, you vote, you vote totally against, you know, all of, all of those allies that you have. Um, maybe, it, you know, that's my, my own personal opinion, but I mean, To me, that is one huge way that we can make a difference. It is. I think that, you know, I think going into politics, you know, everybody is going to have their own direction that they go politically in how you want the laws and everything in our country, right? And there's so many different lanes and so many different people you can vote for. And at the end of the day, you know, as we're talking about white privilege and we're talking about racism specifically, you know, voting does, you do have to look at the laws that would be passed under the person that you're voting for. Um, if you truly want to recognize how to begin the process of taking racism seriously and owning that, and how do we look at which candidates will because they can all talk too. Candidates mm-hmm. can say, sure, come on, people of color, come support me because you know I'm going to pass laws. Guess what? It doesn't happen. No way. Yep. Right? <laughs> then you have somebody who doesn't, who do, right, who doesn't talk about it, but will actually pass legislation for people of color. So, you know, voting a certain way for a certain politician and a certain, you can vote Democrat all you want. But that doesn't mean they're going to pass laws that are going to do it. We, as white people, have to force the people we vote for Mm -hmm. to pass laws for people of color because we are the ones in power. There are not more people of color in power than there are white people. So people of color help get white people in. And then what do we sit up there? To, to, To Laura's point, the white progressive sitting on the pulpit, telling everybody how great we are mm-hmm. and nothing changes. Nothing That's right. Changes. Nothing changes. So until we empower pe- white people pass laws to make changes. That's it. And I think to, you know, the, the law I have a, you know, the political, as soon as we went there, I was like, <gasps> I gasped. I'm like, Oh gosh, you know, this whole political system, which is so, white and unjust. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. I think it's our job as women, as white people to, to keep talking 
and not wait for these laws to be passed, that this is, you know, change can happen amongst us because people learn and educate and open their minds and turn and do this U-turn. And as we talk about that in IFS too, is doing a U-turn, looking inward to understand yourself. And the policies and the structure of which we live in are all in the white favor. That's just how the conscious, I heard uh, which podcast, I forget, I've been listening to so many, but someone, you know, as white people were like, God, Oh, it was this- Beyond Picket Fences? Oh, <laughs> great job. <laughs> I heard it on Beyond Picket Fences that, <laughs> this, that everyone's like, the white people are like, oh, this system is so messed up. And it was some, it was a black person who said, no, it's not. It's do- the system is doing exactly what it was built to do. Which is true, built on white privilege, built on Mm -hmm. white men creating a system. And now we're just doing that system. Mm -hmm. So that was an interesting thing. So I do think that, yes, politics, you know, but how can we do it at a grassroots level, which is bringing me back to, you know, my core social work values, which is creating change at a grassroots level, which is, you know, what we're doing here, having these conversations, talking to people in our families extending ourselves and making ourselves uncomfortable to do something about it versus feeling uncomfortable and shutting it all down. Well, and I think beyond those personal um, conversations and relationships, we can bring that into our workplace. And, you know, um, if, you know, you're part of the the PTCO at school, I I thought of an example um, where I, you know, I was speaking up, um, about, and this has nothing to do with racism, but, you know, it's pretty common to do um, muffins with moms or donuts with dads. And I thought, you know, a lot of, a lot of these kids have two moms or two dads, or they don't have a dad or, you know, how polarizing Mm -hmm. that can be. Um, Mm -hmm. And so just like little changes, just, just stopping to think in every, um, in every facet or every club or, you know, everywhere where you have a voice stop and think and use that voice. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what, and I will just ask this question, which is like, why is it so hard to use our voice? And that is something, you know, I struggle with not in my work because I need my voice as a therapist. And when I'm in that therapist part, it's real easy for me to use my voice when my out in the world and I'm Laura and I'm connected to something or I feel an injustice, I have an easier time speaking up for things that actually aren't my own personal struggle, which is interesting. As you talk about, you know, speaking up, Mandy, like what is it that allows us to speak up about certain things and then get real quiet or feel anxious and feel our body go, uh oh, and our throat chakra tightens and we say, no, no, I can't talk about this. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I can just bring that example for myself, which is being a white Jewish woman in times growing up. And I was in environments where there were so many slanderous comments made about Jewish people. And I was really quiet. I was in a college where there weren't a lot of Jewish people and I just kept quiet. Um, My daughter last year at North High School, she is 16 now, so she was 15 and a boy showed a picture of a swastika. And showed it to her specifically. And the teacher was like outraged. She had never seen anything like this. She was just dumbfounded, didn't know what to do, called us, you know, my daughter's parent, both of us, meaning my, her, her dad and myself were all Jewish. And my daughter was adamant, please, mom, don't make a big deal of this. Please don't make a big deal of this. And she didn't want to be, she didn't want to stand out. Mm-hmm. She didn't want to, st- and I get it because I had been the same thing. And this other part of me is as a mother and teacher going, what am I teaching her? Mm. Mm-hmm. So for me, it is easy to t- easier, not easy to have these uncomfortable conversations about things that I feel all people are equal yet. If I don't identify the fact that my whiteness is serving me and elevating me in a system that's built for me, then I'm ignoring it. You know, that goes into assimilation. They talk about, you know, what is, um, you know, perceived white, which would be your skin is pale, right? And people treat you like you're white. So they talk about how, um, uh, 
history, Italians coming over, right? Racism against, and um, they were able to assimilate as long as they could talk white, Mm -hmm. act white, keep the skin light, right? Armenians the same way, right? They were classified as white because of scientific testing that was done to prove that they were white and their skin could stay white. And, you know, it, it, it's one of those things that as, um, you know, they talk about how, you know, even in the black community, you know, the, the lighter skinned you are, the more privileged you are. Right. And so that all goes back to, you know, your daughter's want want and need to assimilate mm-hmm. and not to stand out and she can totally because of her white skin exactly she and can. she can she can she nobody will know she's jewish unless somebody says something or that is exactly right it, right where people of color don't have that they don't have that or if they're mixed and they don't have a you know unless they're out in the sun like you know our daughters are very light very light skinned. And so, you know, they can easily assimilate as long as they wear sunblock. Right. So, you know, um, yeah, well, and our, our, our youngest son too is the same way. So, um, you know, that goes into, um, her, her desire and begging you not to have to deal with that. Yep. Hard as well. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that this is a, a, a good pot, a good time to, um, to wrap up, to yeah. wrap up. Great hour, Laura. That was awesome. Oh, such a deep conversation. That was and... really great. Can I ask you a funny story? Can I ask for a funny story? Yeah. From you? Do you want to? Okay. Do you want to talk about poops or periods? <laughs> um, periods. Great. Okay. Oh, tell me you. a funny period story. <laughs> period story. Um, is this to sh- wait? Is this to shift out of this hard conversation? Is that what, <laughs> what we're doing? Or are we putting us? Ding, ding, ding. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. Oh, you, you know, you know, all I know, well. Naomi. Let's just get out of that uncomfortable. No, but I really do. Before we do go to the funny, which I yeah. appreciate that this is this is 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 a heavy. It's so heavy, and we're not in a hopeful place. And I think that that's important to acknowledge that where it's okay to feel that despair and heaviness. And hopefully we can use that to, to create this ripple effect of conversation and extend ourselves into more discomfort and be okay with it and learn from it and grow from it. So before we go on to the funny, I think that's what we want to do podcast too. I, your next podcast, um, we had made a note about discomfort. Okay. And yeah. going into that, that we'll go uh, another, co- another podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking into that. So yes, parts of fun. We can, we can shift out into funny, um, (laughs) to make ourselves just kind of breathe a little like, ah, okay. What is funny? Because that feels good. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, period. Let's see. My (laughs) most embarrassing moment was when I first got my period using a tampon and (laughs) I was in, I was in an all girls school. So I had that as a saving grace in high school, but coming out of the pool for gym class and yeah, not really understanding that. Yeah. Tampons are helpful, but you do need to change them. Um, (laughs) So I had blood dripping as we all got out of the pool and we're standing, you know, there and blood is dripping down my leg. Um, it's really quite embarrassing. I was like, oh my gosh, no one told me about this part. I thought if you put a tampon (laughs) in and you go swimming, you're all good. (laughs) <laughs> so we've uh, got a podcast that we're doing next week the week after anyway, uh, yeah it's already yeah. recorded about period our first periods so we have we have funny stories that we're gonna um tell very uh, it's similar people need more instruction on tampons that's what i'm <laughs> figuring out we don't spend a time enough time mentoring <laughs> young women on uh Uh, tampons oh goodness that's funny well great thanks laura all right thanks laura well we will uh look forward to our next conversation bye guys thanks for having me on your podcast it's been a real pleasure to chat with you all right you too Bye. bye Hey, wait just a minute before you go. If you are left wanting to hear more from Laura Goldstein like we were, head on over to Patreon and sign up for a bonus episode with her. 
Go to patreon.com, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash join forward slash beyond picket fences to sign up for bonus episodes, early release episodes, and more. While we love bringing these podcasts to you each week, the software, equipment, and hosting sites cost money that adds up month over month. For just the price of a cup of coffee or less, depending on how many words you add to your Starbucks order, you can help support us by signing up for our Patreon. And in turn, we'll show our appreciation by giving you more. Thanks for listening. See you again next week.